And the Parsha's Mishpatim is that Parsha where our eyes all glaze over. Verse after verse after verse, detailed legalistic material. This is the entire body of uh, criminal law, civil law, <coughs> tort law, spread over several chapters. And that's what the parasha really is about. So we're not going to get into technicalities, but I think that there are some very important ideas we can extract from this parasha just by focusing on the first verse, on the first puzzle. We've said many times that the Torah is written with an economy of words. So therefore, a single verse can intentionally be put in a place to have a double meaning. Chazal say, Mikra echad yot l'kama taimim. A single verse can have many interpretations. Kepatish yipotse tzela, like a sledgehammer which strikes a rock and the rock shatters. So in the same way that the rock shatters, splinters fly in all directions, a single verse can have many, many interpretations. Now this verse, this first verse, has at least two different interpretations. Let's see the uh, words themselves. It says, Ve'ele ha-mishpatim. These are the judgments, asher tosim lifnehem, which you should place before them. Now, the question is, who is the you, and who is the them? So there are at least two different interpretations. One interpretation is that you is a directive to the teachers of the Jewish people. And, uh, of course, the uh, greatest teacher of the Jewish people was Moshe himself. So God is telling Moshe, these are the judgments that you, as a teacher, should place before the Jewish people as students. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that you refers to litigants, and them refers to the judges. These are the judgments, these are the cases that you, as litigants, should present to the judges for decision. Two different interpretations. In the first interpretation, we're talking about theory. That the laws should be taught by the teachers to the students, by Moshe to the people, in order that everybody should be familiar with the law. There is an ideal in Judaism that the law, even criminal law, civil law, is not meant to be something which is a specialty for experts. This is meant to be something that everybody knows. And therefore, the teachers of the Jewish people are commanded not only to inspire their audiences, not only to give them uh, religious direction, but that they should teach everybody, the masses, civil law, criminal law, tort law, etc. These are the judgments that you, as teachers, should place before the members of the nation. The second interpretation is, these are the types of cases that, as litigants, you should present to the judges to be decided. The Rashi brings the two interpretations and expands on both. So let's take them one at a time. First, the interpretation that the teachers are meant to transmit these to the students. So Rashi says that what is the meaning of the expression of tussin that you should place before them? So I'll read you the wording of Rashi. Don't even think, Loimar, to say, I will teach them the law two or three times until they know the text by heart. That's not enough. But rather, you have to trouble yourself to explain the reasons and the rationale behind the law. And that's the meaning of Hashir Tasim Lefnehim. Kishulchan Aruch, like a table which is set, Umuchan Lecho Lefnei Ha'adam. And a person can sit at the table. That's Tasim Lefnehim. You put it in front of them like a meal which is served, ready to eat. 
Now, that means as follows. That people should be ignorant of the law that goes without saying there's no need to tell us not so. Of course, everyone has to know the law. But I would have thought that it's enough that people should have a superficial knowledge of the law. So that's why the wording is, I should toss them with name. We should place it before them like a shulchan aruch, like a set table that they're ready to eat. That every single Jew has to not only know the law, he has to understand the law, understand its reasons, understand its steps. Now this is a very, very important thing. And it's a strange thing that society has never come to appreciate this. Because nowadays we, we live in a, a time where there is no common knowledge of the law. Now, the average man on the street does not know what his obligations are, what his responsibilities are, what he's meant to do in a given circumstance. When a controversy arises, he hires himself a lawyer, and the lawyer tells him, well, this is what you should have done, this is what you can do, and uh, this is how we're going to argue your case, and this is how we'll get you off the hook, or maybe we'll make a settlement, or something like that. But most of us go through life <coughs> with no awareness at all of what our responsibilities are under the law. And we're perfectly satisfied with that. And then when we get ourselves into trouble, and then all of a sudden the lawyer tells us, well, you made a big mistake, and uh, this is what the judge is going to say, and you're going to have to pay a lot of money, and we're all surprised, how can that be? Like, I have no idea that I'd be liable. And I argue before the court, and I say that, Your Honor, I have no idea that uh, I had these responsibilities. And the judge will say that uh, ignorance is no defense. Everyone is obligated to know the law. That's very nice, that uh, ignorance is no defense. So why doesn't society place a premium on informing people of their responsibilities. The people should know what the law is. Because instead, we treat law as a specialized subject only for experts, only for people after um, years of elementary school and high school and university, then they can begin to study the law in law school. And it's something which is only to be studied by these uh, technocrats. And everyone else is kept in the dark, and yet we're held responsible when we run afoul of the law, we should have known. Ignorance is no defense. I think I read an article somewhere. Um, a, a secular writer visited a uh, Jewish school in Israel. And uh, this parsha, Parsha's Mishpatim, is studied by 11 year olds in school. <coughs> now you reach it when you're about 11 years old. And maybe in Israel, even younger. And uh, this writer said that the subjects that were discussed in this elementary school classroom by the 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, really would have been discussed in America, perhaps in a first or second year law school class. You know, there's a discussion of liability, tort liability, and bailments, and uh, real property, and so on and so forth. And th these are subjects that would be the subject of a first year uh, law school course. And these are discussed by 10 and 11 year olds studying Chumash in, in Haida, Parsha <coughs> Mishpat. Because Klal Yisrael understands that there is a premium to be placed on universal literacy. Everyone is meant to know the law. We're meant to live by the law. If we're meant to live by it, we're meant to know it. And therefore, it's not something which is to be studied by uh, experts in the ivory tower, this is something that every person is meant to know, meant to, to learn. Now, admittedly, there is a little bit of a problem. The problem is that the cases which the Torah speaks about are cases that are not part of our experience. We talk about oxen goring one another, and we talk about uh, people digging holes in the street and animals falling in, that type of thing. These aren't the types of things that uh, we live with. Because we would have hoped that the Torah should speak of automobile accidents and those types of things and uh, product liability, 
things that we're familiar with. The truth is this. The truth is, number one, we have to know that the principles are all the same. The principles that govern 21st century cases can all be derived from the precedents of the uh, 4th century BC. They're really the same legal principles. It's only a question of translating them into the types of cases that arise today as opposed to the types of cases that arose thousands of years ago. But the SOTOs, the fundamental principles, are really the same. But it is a challenge. Sometimes when we learn these parashias and we learn the Gemaras that talk about the subject of these parashias, sometimes we, we fail to realize uh, how relevant they are to us in practice because we tend to think, okay, it's talking about an ox. Well, we don't have oxen, so it's not relevant to us. There's a very lovely story about the great uh, teacher of Yisrael Salanter, an amazing story, that uh, at the end of his life he lived in Germany. And at that time the fashion for rabbis was to wear very, very stiff tap hats. That's what the style was. And uh, once a group of rabbis visited him, and as they were leaving he told them that you know, it's a very windy day today, and you should you know, hold your hat very securely on your head, because the Talmud says in the Sechaz Bavakama that in a windy day, you have to hold your hat on your head. Now, there's no such statement in the Talmud, in the Sechaz Bavakama, that in a windy day, you have to hold your hat on your head. So one of the rabbis said, Rabbi Salanter, I'm familiar with the entire Talmud, and I know that there's no statement in the Sechaz Bavakama that on a windy day you have to hold your hat on your head. So he says, no, it's, it's there. It's, it's really there. So it's not there. Where, where, where is it there? So he says like this. He says, there's a Gemara that says the following. Let's say a person puts a rack on a roof. It's a heavy boulder on a roof. And uh, the wind blows the boulder off and the boulder causes damage. So the Talmud says the person who put the rack on the roof is liable. Since he put the rack in a place where it could be blown off, it caused damage, so he's held liable. So we saw Slav, said like this. He said, let's think about this for a moment. Okay, the Talmud is talking about a rack. Does it have to be a rack? It must it be a rack? What if it's a hat? Would the law be any different? <coughs> so the other rabbi said, no. No difference between a rack and a hat. The principle is the same. If you put the hat on the roof and the wind would blow off the hat and would cause damage, you'd be liable. Very good. Now, when it says you put it on the roof, does it have to be a roof? What if it was the top of your head? Would the principle be the same? So I would say, admittedly, that would be the same principle. If you put a hat on the top of your head and the wind blew it off and it hurt somebody, you'd be liable. So he says it's an explicit Gemara in the Masechus Bavakama. The Gemara Bavakama is talking about a rack on a roof. This is a hat on the head. No fundamental difference. It's really the same principle. So therefore, on a windy day, you have to hold your hat securely on your head. Why? Because if the wind blows it off and it hurts somebody, you'd be, you'd be liable. So this is the difficulty. Sometimes we, we read some of these cases and we say, oh, that's not relevant to us. But it's really relevant to us. The same principles just uh, expanded that apply to oxen and uh, people carrying uh, things in the street could also apply to liability in case of automobile collisions and so on and so forth, things that which do happen. And therefore, uh, with not even that much creativity, we can certainly see how the cases of the Torah are relevant in practice to, to us. But that's the first thing. The first thing is that the Torah places a premium on universal <coughs> literacy in the law. Everyone has to know the law. And the Talmud says an amazing thing furthermore. The Talmud says that if a person wants to be a pious person, a person wants to be a chassid, a person wants to be a pious person, he should study the laws of torts, the laws of damages. Now we think of piety, we think of piety in terms of prayer, in terms of the great charitable works, in terms of meditation, reflection. What is when a person wants to be pious, 
you should study the laws of Torah? The answer is because the first thing is do no harm. Because you want to be a good person, the first thing is don't injure anybody, don't hurt anybody. So therefore, to avoid doing that, you have to know exactly what your responsibilities are. That's why you have to learn these subjects. You have to know. It's a very, very important thing. So the truth is that, that really all of us should uh, should uh, be very, very careful and learn uh, some work of Jewish law that will tell us about our responsibilities to avoid damaging people. In cases of loans, we borrow money, exactly what our responsibilities are. I'll, I'll mention as an aside that one area where people are, are, are really ignorant is in the area of interest. Ribis. Because we know that the halacha is, the law is, that a Jew is not allowed to lend money to another Jew and charge interest. It's a prohibition. And uh, sometimes a transaction can be constructed in such a way that it is not technically considered a loan and the problems of interest can be avoided. And the Jewish banks in Israel uh, do this. They, uh, the transactions are constructed in such a way as to circumvent the laws of, of interest. But uh, we have to know that there are many, many common transactions which would be actually Torah violations of the law of interest. For example, let me give you a, a, a uh, very common example. Let's say um, someone, you give someone a credit card. Let's say you give your child a credit card. And you want to teach the child responsibility. And you say, listen, I'm giving you the credit card, but you have to make the payments. You have to make the payments. You see, halavai, I should be in that situation. You know, I have a different situation. I give the kids credit cards, and I make the payments. <laughs> which, is, which is not problematic from a halachic perspective. It's problematic from an economic perspective. But Okay, that's what's done is done. Too late, to, you know, to put the toothpaste back in the tube. But let's say you're you're educating your child and say, here's a credit card, and but you have to make the payments. You have to make the payments. <laughs> so the child says, fine, perfect, no problem. And the child ends up uh, not making the payments in a timely way, and he has to pay interest. So what do you say? Any problem there? Jew doesn't pay interest. Well, a Jew can pay interest to a Gentile. A Jew can pay interest to a credit card company, to a bank, no problem. Any problem in this transaction? He's making the payments on the credit card. To the bank. He's sending the check to the to the bank. Is there a problem? Very serious how it's a Torah prohibition. I'll tell you why. Because if I use your credit card to buy something, who really is liable to the bank? Me or my father? I'm using my father's credit card. Who's really liable? My father. It's his credit card, right? So really what happens is like this. When I use the credit card, my father is borrowing money from the bank and lending the money to me. That's really what's happening. When I pay him interest, I am paying interest on the loan that he made to me. How am I paying him the interest? By paying his bills. But I'm really not making a payment to the bank. I'm making a payment to my father. How am I paying my father? I'm paying my father by paying his bill for it. So what really is happening is my father is borrowing money from the bank. The father in turn is lending it to me. When I pay the bank, I'm really paying my father's that for him, I'm really paying my father back for the loan he made to me. It is a Torah prohibition of interest to use someone's credit card and make payments on them. Little known fact. But if you pay on time without interest, it's okay, no? If there's no interest, no interest. But how often does that happen? <laughs> how would you get around that? Tell me, when does that happen? How would you get around that issue? How do you get around that issue? You make the payments, the father. <laughs> that's, that's how I get around this. No, 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 no. I avoid the problem of business and, and, and just poor for the 
for the. I have the same issue, but, but so there's no other way. There's no other way. I mean, there'd be ways where they have to. It's good. There are ways of getting around it, but the point is that it is a, a serious problem, and it's the kind of thing that happens all the time, all the time. And uh, we have to be aware that this is, is problematic. There are many, many, many other other instances of, 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 of violations of the laws of interest, which are so easily um, transgressed. What if the credit card is in the child's name, but obviously you're on the hook because you're not going to let trouble happen? No, no, no. That's something else. The, there, the child is liable to the bank. Mm -hmm. So good. You, you, you feel bad for the child. So you'll bail him out, but it's his liability. That's not a question. So you haven't violated the interest. No, no problem. There. That's <laughs> his. It's his. It's his. When, when you say his name is on the card, yeah. that, that, that doesn't mean his name is on the card as, as a supplementary card holder. No, his name. You mean the, the account is in his name. Yeah. In other words, if you, for example, if you are the primary cardholder and you just get a card in his name for him, that would equally be uh, problematic. The mere fact that his name is in the card isn't the point. The point is that, that it's, you're the one who's really borrowing the money when he uses the card. What if you co-sign for him? Pardon? What if you co-sign? If you co-sign, it could also be a problem, but uh, it's, it's more complex if you co-sign. If you co-sign, but he's mainly liable, it's not the same thing. Well, you're like security, yeah. you know, if he doesn't make the payment. Yeah. Okay, so these are, these are complicated things. So everyone has to know what the law is, and uh, that's what the Torah says, that Moshe Rabbein was commanded to explain the law, not just to, to repeat the law, that they should have a superficial knowledge, but rather they should, they should know it in a comprehensive way, because uh, if you want to do the right thing, you have to know the rationale which underlies the law. That's the first half of the verse. Now there's another half of the verse which says, these are the types of cases which you present as litigants to them, to the judges. So who's them? Who are the qualified judges? So Rashi says an amazing thing over here. It, to them, v'lo lifnei goyim, and not before Gentile courts. Means you shall present these judgments, these cases, to Jewish courts, to what they did, and not to Gentile courts. This is the prohibition. If two Jews have a controversy, they are not allowed to present this to their coach, they can't present their case to a non-Jewish court. They are obligated to settle this in the base den. Now, this is a, a tragedy of contemporary Jewish life, that we don't have, but they didn't. We don't have Jewish courts that are effective and efficient to be able to uh, settle these disputes. Um, but that's the obligation of Jewish law. The community is obligated to have a based in, it's obligated to have a court, so that when Jews have controversies, they can present it to a based and, and settle it according to halacha, according to Jewish law. Not that God forbid that they should resort to secular courts. And Rashi explains that there are two possible problems in presenting the case to a coach or lock. Number one, let's say the laws are different. Let's say, for example, Ruvain sues Shimon. And in halacha, Ruvain has no claim, let's say. Well, according to the halacha, the uh, judgment will be in favor of the defendant. But the secular law is different. The Ontario law is different. In Ontario, perhaps the plaintiff has a claim. So if instead of going to a Besden, Ruvain figures, listen, why should I go to a Besden? I lost the case. I'll go to an Ontario court, and I'll win the case. Because in uh, Ontario law, I have a valid claim. So first, Rashi says that is a problem of gezel. That's a problem of theft. You are essentially stealing from that other Jew money that you have no claim to. If the halacha is that he doesn't owe you the money, and you figure, I'll go to an alternative system in which he does owe me the money, so you're committing an act of theft. Because you are taking money from that other person to which you're not entitled. That's a serious problem. So if the laws are different, that goes without saying you can't present your case. There are co -shalakim. You can't present your case in a Gentile court if that court is not going to rule the way the halakha would rule. But let's say, says Rashi, 
you knew that in a given situation, the Gentile court will rule as the Jewish court would rule. Let's say it's an open and shut case. Someone owes you money, and uh, you have an IOU, and you can present it in a business or present it in a Gentile court. Either way, the court will say, <laughs> you borrowed money, you have to pay. Right? It's a pretty open and shut case. So perhaps in that case, there's nothing wrong with presenting the case to a Gentile court. Says Rashi, no, even here it's problematic. Why? And Rashi says an astounding thing over here. And it, it, we have to understand whether this is applicable nowadays. That's what I'm talking about. Rashi says, because when a person presents his case to a Gentile court, this is giving credence, this is giving validity to the Avaita Zara, to the deity of that particular nation. You are giving respect to the deity of that nation, and that's something which a Jew should not do. And that's why a Jew must present his cases to a Jewish court, not to a Gentile court. Now, let me explain this rationally. Whenever we speak about courts of law or government, the basic question, this is probably the most basic question in political science, is legitimacy. What gives the government, what gives this court the right to interfere in private people's affairs? You know, the court says that uh, this property which is being held by Ruvain now has to be given to Shimon, uh, and the court will issue a judgment, will compel Ruvain to surrender the property. What gives the court the right to make such judgments? What legitimizes that, that ruling? For that matter, what legitimizes any act of government? For most of human history, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, until probably sometime in the 1600s, it was always assumed that the legitimacy of government came from above. You may have heard the expression, divine right of kings. It was always assumed that the legitimacy of government came from above, from upstairs. How so? In some societies, actually, it was the ecclesiastical authority that appointed the kings. Like Charlemagne was uh, crown crowned as the uh, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. The Pope was considered God's representative on earth, at least for Catholics, and uh, he appointed the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Sometimes it's not so explicit, sometimes it's the mere fact that since presumably God runs the world, if God allowed this person to come to power, <laughs> it's understood that God acquiesces, and uh, therefore his authority is, at least tacitly, derived from above. But this is the idea of the divine right of kings. This was assumed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This was the case. The doctrine of the divine right of kings really fell into um, uh, disdain, I guess you could say, when Europe splintered into many different forms of Christianity with the Reformation. So now you have uh, many, many different Christian sects, and uh, which one confers legitimacy? And that's the, the question. So a new paradigm emerged, which we'll discuss in a few moments. But for most of human history, the assumption was that legitimacy comes from above. So, a Jewish court derives its authority from, from the Torah and from the Rebbeinu Shlomo. Where does a Roman court derive its legitimacy from? Where does a Greek court derive its legitimacy from? from uh, their gods, right? The Roman court judges by the authority of the Roman gods. The Greek court judges by the authority of the Greek gods. And this was a, a given, this was a commonplace, that the authority of a court derives from the deities of that nation. So if a Jew, instead of going to a Jewish court, goes to a Greek court, goes to a Roman court, what is he really doing? He's giving credence, he's giving respect and honor to the deity of that nation, because that court claims to be operating as agents of that deity, and you're going to them for judgment. So the fact that they're going to rule the same way the halacha would rule, 
only solves the problem of theft. Okay, it's not theft, because they're going to give the same ruling that a Jewish court would have given. But you are giving respect and honor to the authority which legitimizes that court. That is something that a Jew can't do. A Jew cannot give legitimacy to Avayda Zara. That's what Rashi says. Now the question is whether this really is so applicable nowadays. Because as we said, the, the idea of divine right of kings has collapsed. What is the, the more common paradigm today for the legitimacy of government is the idea of the social contract. That the legitimacy of government does not come from above, it comes from below. It comes from the governed. It comes from the governed. Now the social contract is really a fiction. Historically, there never was a social contract. People never got together and uh, agreed to accept government. It's a theoretical construct. It's what people would have done, should have done. But uh, in a sense, you have a society. A society can't function without government for reasons that we'll discuss in a few moments. And therefore, it's considered as if the society accepted the government as its authority. If you're living in a country, there is a tacit acceptance of the government of that country. You surrender your freedoms, or some of your freedoms, to the government in exchange for something which the government provides you that you desperately need and can't live without. And that's the idea of the social contract. So today, what legitimizes acts of government is not the divine, the acts of government are legitimized by the nation. So perhaps nowadays it's not quite as bad going to a Gentile court. Again, because you're not giving credit to the divine authority, you're giving credit to the governed who legitimized that court and that government. So it might not be the same severity, but again, for the other reason, Generally, the laws are so different, it would almost be inconceivable that you could avoid the problem of gezel if you go to a non-Jewish court as opposed to a uh, Jewish court. But in any case, let's, let's, let's explore this idea. Are you supposed to follow the laws of the land? Or something uh, the state's idea? Whatever right. country you live right. in, right. those laws right. have Dina to be Dina. That law, following the laws of the land, yeah. applies in a very very, very narrow segment of cases. It applies, first of all, to laws that the government makes for its own benefit. Meaning, in other words, let's think about this for a second. What are the, the real functions of government? What are the most important functions of government? This is a very serious question in political science as well. Um, you know, many people think that the role of government is to give the people what they want. <laughs> Red and circuses. Yeah. So uh, if you're following the news a little bit south of the border, right, this has become a little bit of a controversy. You know, America still prides itself on respecting liberty, but uh, the government seems intent on crushing that. And it's going to make uh, everybody pay for medical services even if they see them as morally wrong. Very, very serious uh, issue going on down south. But the real functions of government, the most important functions of government, are to defend the people from external threats and internal threats. That's really the purpose of government. The government is there to defend us from attack from outside and to defend us from internal threats, uh, crime, etc., etc., etc. This is the definition of the limited government, which uh, is based on uh, enlightenment principles. Um, you know, nowadays, you'd associate that with the libertarian branch of uh, political philosophy. Those are the most central functions of government. So government collects taxes to pay for defense, to pay for police, etc., etc., etc. That is considered a legitimate function of government 
you're obligated to pay your taxes for that. Now, government then steps in and decides to do sorts of other things, right? It, it's the eyes, well, we're going to provide hospitals and health care and build roads and, and do so on and so forth. Those aren't legitimate to the same extent. Those are not classical uh, missions of government. How this came to be is a long, long discussion. It really is rooted in a totally different view of the role of government based on Rousseau and, and others. That the purpose of government is to advance the general will. I mean, it, it's a complicated subject. But um, when government decides, well, we're going to legislate laws just um, for the purpose of settling disputes between and among people, that already is a departure from the, the really legitimate function of the government. The law of the democracy doesn't apply. The law of Dina Malchazim doesn't apply to, to interpersonal disputes. It only applies to relations with the government. Anyway, but the, uh, the, uh, the point is that nowadays, I'm saying it may be a little bit different. It may not be the same severity as it was once upon a time when government was considered as deriving its legitimacy from above. I want to point out that the Torah clearly does not buy into the social contract. The Torah clearly, um, I mean, the fact that the civil law, criminal law is in the Torah itself, <laughs> which came from God, is probably the greatest proof of this. But it's clear that the Torah is telling us that legitimacy comes from above. And one of the interesting uh, ways this is symbolized is by a halacha which we derive from a juxtaposition of our verse to the end of last week's parsha. The last verse in last week's parsha talks about the altar and the sanctuary. The altar and the sanctuary. It says, Lo sal that when you build the altar in the courtyard of the sanctuary, you should not build it with steps. Because you should not ascend to the altar with steps, rather you should have a ramp, and uh, the reasons are not for the current discussion, but the last week's parsha ends with the laws about the altar. And this week's parsha begins with civil and criminal law. So what is the juxtaposition? What's the connection? Normally we expect that there should be some continuity between the parshas and the Torah. So Chazal say from here we learn that the Sanhedrin, that the Supreme Court, convenes in the temple adjacent to the altar. Or the offices of the Supreme Court were in the base of English next to the altar. That's the halakha. Why should that be? Because why should the Supreme Court have its offices in the temple? The answer is because there is no separation of church and state as is uh, imagined nowadays. But there's an integration. Because if the legitimacy of government comes from the divine, from God, then the, the place of the court is exactly in the temple. The whole idea of separation of church and state is rooted in a different conception of government. If you see the legitimacy of government as coming from the governed, then new things happen. And let me explain what happens. There's a social contract, call it a fictional social contract. We agree that uh, there should be a government which will have certain powers. We authorize that. We consent to that. We surrender our freedoms to the government. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because the government provides us with things we can't provide for ourselves. It gives us protection. It prevents anarchy. So therefore, we're willing to surrender certain freedoms. How much freedom are we willing to surrender? Like, how much are we willing to give up? And this is a fascinating subject. There were political philosophers. Thomas Hobbes said that people would be willing to give up 
anything except their conscience. That you can't give up. You can't be forced to think contrary to the way you would think. But to, to save your skin, you'd be willing to surrender any freedom, any right, etc. And therefore he held that any laws that the government makes are legitimate, no matter what they take away from you. Your right to speak, your right to practice your religion, your right to live where you want, whatever it would be, he held that it's all legitimate. Why? Because you surrender every freedom to the government in exchange for protection from anarchy. Now, Locke held differently. Locke held, no, there are certain rights that are inalienable, that a person does not give up because he cannot give them up. They are rights conferred by God, and therefore you cannot surrender them. So you may surrender other freedoms. You may surrender some of your money in taxes. You may surrender uh, other freedoms, you know, the right to drive down the left side of the road, <laughs> right? As opposed to the right, that you surrender. You surrender for the smooth running of society. But there are certain rights that are inalienable rights. You cannot give them up. And uh, in the American Declaration of Independence, which is probably the finest example of Enlightenment political philosophy, those rights were the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? Those the person doesn't surrender. So if you have a situation where the government begins to impose itself and take those away, then the government is acting illegitimately. And this is an amazing thing, because in, in Enlightenment political philosophy, the, the rights which we cherish, the right to speak and the right to practice our religion and so on and so forth, these are not rights which the government gives us. These are rights which the government cannot take away. The government is acting illegitimately when it tries to take away these rights. Uh, Canada, by the way, has gotten it wrong. You know, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is, is a, a total misunderstanding of the political tradition of uh, modern democracies. Words, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms looks at it as these are rights which the government grants you. The government grants you the right to practice religion, it gives you the right to speak, and so on and so forth, and therefore there's a notwithstanding clause, right? That the government says, we're going to give you these rights, but there are certain instances where we won't give you those rights. Right? The United States, the Bill of Rights in the United States, which is much older, more venerable, I, I believe did get it right. Because it didn't say that we're going to give you these rights. It says these are rights we cannot take away from you. There's no notwithstanding clause. It's an absolute. Right? These rights cannot be taken away because to even attempt to take away these rights is not a legitimate act of government. They are rooted in the alienable rights which people do not and cannot surrender to government. That's the, the founding principle. Now this is an important thing to understand. You know, in Parshish Mishpatim, I don't want to get into a lot of technicalities, but the first law, the first law that's mentioned in Parshish Mishpatim is the law of the Hebrew slave. And this is somewhat of an embarrassment to many people that uh, Judaism should uh, validate slavery. And, you know, many people in, in the period of American slavery justified the practice of slavery by turning to the Bible. They said, look, the Bible itself refers to slavery. Now, the truth is that uh, Jewish slavery, as uh, depicted in the Bible, is much more enlightened than uh, the enslavement of the blacks as was practiced in, uh, in America. I mean, here th there are tremendous limitations that are placed on the ability of owners to enslave fellow Jews. A contract of up to six years. After six years, the person goes free. Even during the six years, the Chazal tell us that if a person acquires an evidence of Rika Kona, only afterwards if he acquired a master. That if there's one pillow, <laughs> the slave gets it. If there's one portion of food, the slave gets it. If there's one bed, the slave gets it. Because you have to treat them better than you treat them yourself. And uh, in uh, Parashas uh, Bahar, 
there are many additional limitations as to how we treat our servants. For example, there's a halacha that lo yimachum keras of it. They can't be sold on the trading block publicly. But that's the meaning. It says you're not allowed to work them avoidas parach. You can't impose on them back-breaking labor, difficult, crushing labor. It says you can't impose on them demeaning labor. It can't be something which undermines their dignity. And there are many, many laws which, which limit the ability of a Jew to enslave a fellow Jew. But nevertheless, right, many people see this as an embarrassment. Why should, why should Judaism endure such a such a institution. Now there are many, 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 many uh, aspects to this question. I'll just mention uh, one of them. Well, let's talk about the situations where a Jew is sold as a slave. One is to make restitution for theft. Once he stole, he has to make restitution. He has no money, so he sold and the proceeds of the sale are given to the person from whom he stole his restitution. Now, is that less just than the way we treat criminals? What do we do with thieves? We put them in the slam, put them in jail. Now, let me ask you a question. The person who is the victim of the theft, does he have any benefit from the fact this person is in jail? No. What was really accomplished? And what are the purposes of incarceration? Okay, you might argue you want to protect society from further theft, but uh, rehabilitation, is there any likelihood that he'll be rehabilitated by uh, putting him in prison with other hardened criminals? I think that if you would sell him as an Eved in a nice Jewish home where he would be with dignity, there'd probably be a better chance of rehabilitation. So I don't know if, if this institution of servitude is any, uh, any worse than uh, what we do to our criminal class. But what's the other situation where a person is sold as a slave? A person who's poor. A person who's poor can't support his family, will sell himself as a slave. So we're saying, no, it's terrible. We shouldn't allow that. So what, what's better? He should starve to death? His family should starve to death? L let me ask you a question. Um, are you for minimum wage laws? Yeah. I'm not. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Very simple. Yeah. Let's say the minimum wage right now is $7. Okay? So what does that mean practically? Many workers, what are they getting paid? $7. What's the, what's the, the actual minimum wage? $8. Whatever it is. What is it now? Ten dollars, let's say. Good, ten dollars. So let me ask the question. So, uh, workers, what are they getting? The minimum wage. Most workers that are affected by this law, the actual minimum wage is zero. Think about it, right? How many people are not working because they're not being hired because their labor is not worth ten dollars an hour? You can't survive with less than $10 an hour. You can't survive with $10 an hour, but you can't survive with a year either. But the people that aren't getting jobs, the people that are unemployed, are getting $0 an hour. Now, let me ask the question. That's why you go Let me ask the question. Wouldn't they be happy to work for $5 an hour if they could get it? The people that are currently getting nothing? Okay, why are they getting nothing? They'd rather go on welfare. Forget welfare, right? <laughs> Forget welfare. Now the point is, what, 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 what minimum wage laws do is that they guarantee that anyone whose labor is not worth the minimum wage will not get a job. But if I have a business, right, and for me it's worthwhile to hire a person at five dollars an hour, right? That's that's what the, an extra worker is worth to me. There is his extra labor will generate five dollars an hour or five and a half dollars an hour or six dollars an hour of added income to my enterprise. It's not worth ten dollars an hour. So five dollars an hour, it's worth it. I'm willing to pay five dollars an hour 
to get the extra $6. If I have to pay $10 an hour for that labor, it's not worth it for me. So what do we end up doing? Not hiring anybody. So the actual minimum wage is not $10 an hour, it's actually zero an hour. Right? This worker who would have gotten $5 is now getting nothing. Now, what percentage of workers in Canada are actually getting the minimum wage? Very low. I, I read an article recently that it's actually an astronomically low figure, because the truth is, most people don't remain at the minimum wage very long, right? If you still have a job after six months, you're probably making more than the minimum wage. And therefore, if there'd be no minimum wage laws, it's true that many people would enter the labor market at lower wages, but probably in a very short period of time, they'd be making more, they'd get raises, they'd advance, etc., and probably would end up making more money. So I'm not a big fan of, of uh, minimum wage laws. But the point is that, that uh, you know, there's a saying in, in, in uh, Jewish literature, ha-hechrech lo yibuna, something which is necessary is not to be scorned. So if a person that needs to support his family and the only thing he can do is sell his labor, even in a way that uh, you know, we as a society would not approve of, why should we stop him? Why should we stop him from doing that? If you're willing to sell your labor for $5 an hour, and you feel that is more dignified, you'd rather do that than go on labor, and on uh, welfare. So why should we say, no, you can't do that. You can't work in Canada for $5 an hour. Instead, go on welfare. Why, why should we tell people that? It doesn't seem to me to be a very nice thing to do. The, the employer can exploit the, the worker by, by saying, OK, then give me a dollar an hour. Then he won't the work. That's what they, 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 they won't work. That, that, that's the point. No one has to work if they don't want to work. No one forcing anybody to work. You want to have welfare, have welfare too. So therefore people make a decision. Should I go on welfare or should I work for a uh, low wage? But the people that want to work for a low wage, let them work for a low wage. But why not? You don't want to work for it, don't work for it. You wouldn't get too many takers. What? I don't think you get too many takers. You get more, I, I think you get more than you'd think. Right? Those people, first of all, let's talk about teenagers. Right? What is the unemployment rate in the United States for black teenagers today? Pretty high. Astronomically high. Right? They can't get entry level jobs. And we're not talking about people that are supporting families. We're talking about people that this will be their first work experience. They'll learn how to keep a schedule. They'll learn responsibility. They'll all sorts of good things, right? Well, why deny that to them? Because you have some, some crazy idea that you know, people have to get $10 an hour? For many of these people, it would be the greatest thing to work for $5 an hour. It would be their first job to get some real work experience, some training, learn some skills learn responsibility, and uh, prepare them for the next job, which will be undoubtedly higher. Why would you want to deny that? But everyone knows this. Everyone knows that the minimum wage laws are really um, cruel to, to teenagers. So the point is this. The point is that I think the whole the, the whole idea that, that uh, oh, this is, this is barbaric, the idea that a person should sell his labor in such a way, is, 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 not, uh, is not a legitimate criticism. And I think that, 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 that if a person feels this is what he has to do to support his family, right, he should have the right to, uh, to do that. But I think there's a, a, another basic issue over here, which we have to explore, which is this, that We tend to think that the supreme value in uh, the, the, the first virtue of uh, society is equality. Everyone should be equal. In other words, what minimum wage laws, for example, are really uh, 
uh, a way of doing is uh, attempt to level the playing field. I mean, it's a meager attempt, but somehow that the, even the poor should be making something which puts them on par with the rich, which of course is nonsense, because uh, you know the CEO of a corporation is not making uh, ten dollars an hour; he's making the equivalent of uh, you know, five thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> you know, so by raising the minimum wage, you're not going to create any type of parity. But the point is that. That we, we, we think of, of equality as being a virtue. You know, uh, progressives want to spread the wealth. We'll spread the wealth by treating everyone equally shabbily. And in the process, we will bring about situations where wealth will not be created because we're creating a disincentive to investment and to uh, risk taking and to work and so on and so forth. But this is the thought that the equality is the first virtue. Equality is only a virtue when you deal with a system which derives its legitimacy from below. When you deal with a system which derives its legitimacy from above, but that's God's prerogative to put everyone in the station. This is where you belong, this is where you belong, this is where you belong. In other words, the Bibana Shleilin has a Torah. The Bibana Shleilin's Torah, Kehanim have one law that applies to them. The VM have another law that applies to them. The Israelim have another law that applies to them. Men have different laws. Women have different laws. You can't object to that. God as creator has the prerogative to station people in various uh, situations as he sees fit. Once he designed mankind, he created groups of people with different natures and qualities. If he decides that there should be unequal treatment under the law, that's certainly his prerogative. When, when the legitimacy of government is derived from the governed, that's when equality becomes a, a virtue. It was, let's remind ourselves of the great dispute between Moshe Rabbeinu and Kairach, right? Kairach comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and says like this, he says, listen, Kol ha'edo kulam kedoshim of Hashem. Everyone is holy, and God is in their midst. Maduat is not so Hashem. Why do you and and Aaron, elevate yourselves over everybody else. I mean, everybody's equally holy, right? So, so there should be equality. We should have an egalitarian society. What does Moshe Benu answer? He says, Boker. In the morning, Hashem will show who he wants to serve as priest. So, Rashi comments, what is this uh, unusual uh, invocation of the word Boker? So Rashi says that just like God set the boundaries of morning and evening, you have the night, and this is where the night ends, and this is where the morning begins. So God also set the boundaries between Kehanim, Levim, and Yisraelim, and this is where the Kehanim function, this is where the Levim function, this is the Israelim function. <laughs> now, the, the beauty of the parsha is that Karach and Moshe Rabbeinu are talking at each other. Right? Karach is speaking as a true uh, social contract theorist. That, that, that government governs by the consent of the governed, and therefore a government of the people, by the people, and for the people places a premium on equality. So what is this idea of maduat is nasu? Why do you elevate yourselves over everybody else? We don't need that. And Moshe Shemaine was speaking as a person who believes in the divine right of kings, which we do believe in, and says, this is God's prerogative. Boker. Just like, no one can have a grievance. Why does night end now and morning begin? And that's how God set up the work. The night has a boundary. This is where night ends. This is where morning begins. This is the sun rises. So therefore, Kehanan have a station. Levium have a station. Israel have a station. You can't contest that. See, so we have to understand that, that, that Mishpatim are, are God's Mishpatim. And if God sets up institutions where there are apparent inequities, that's his prerogative to do so. And that's not something that, that we should be astounded by. So just to review some of the ideas we talked about today, a lot of, a lot of ideas related to Mishpat, the first idea of the universal literacy in the law. That these are the mishpat that Moshe is meant to place before the entire nation. That the law is not meant to be something which is to be studied and absorbed by a class of technocrats that study in law schools and practice in courts. But 
the ideal is that everyone should know the law and live by the law. Right? The goal is not simply to resort to the law for settling disputes. The law is a way of life that every Jew is meant to live by, and therefore the goal of universal literacy in the law is something which the Torah holds up as a premium. Number two, the idea that that when um, divine right was considered the legitimate basis for government, so therefore going to a Gentile court was not only a potential problem of theft, it was also giving credit and credence to a deity which is foreign, and that's why it was especially abhorrent. And uh, the idea that uh, these two schemes of government, divine right versus the social contract, really um, very much change our way of looking at things. In other words, from the social contract position, the first virtue of government would be its promotion of equality. From the divine right perspective, it's an acknowledgement of God's prerogatives of placing people in situations and stations which have to be respected by the rest of us. Okay, so these are some thoughts from Mishpatim. Everyone have a great week, and this is Hashem next week. Sure. Get back. <laughs>